Good morning, folks. This is John Adamson, the Rehab and Documentation Guru, and today I'm doing a video for Michelle, who states that she watches my videos while enjoying a cup of coffee in the morning. Um, thanks, Michelle. I hope I add a little bit of sweetness to your coffee. Uh, anyway, um, I'm drinking coffee right now, too, so maybe we're drinking coffee together. Uh, so she, Michelle asked a question about concurrent therapy, and she said she could see the benefit for some patients for group, which I agree. There's obviously benefit for some, but what's the benefit of doing concurrent? Well, Michelle, just because I like to hear myself talk, I'm going to give you more information than you asked for. Um, so first of all, I want to give you a resource that you can go look at. And um, there's a company called Montero Therapy Services. They're a consulting agency. And uh, if you, I forget the name of the CEO, the person who started it, but we had a chance to have her come speak when I worked for Aegis Therapies. I'll tell you, she's like a ball of fire, uh, but very knowledgeable in Part A, SNF Services. Anyway, MonteroTherapyServices.com. They have uh, basically, uh, well, it's an article called PDPM is coming. Do you know your modes? And I talked about modes just yesterday, actually. Individual concurrent in group therapy in a sniff. And so this is kind of a really helpful article that explains it. I uh, looked it over. They're solid, right on the money. And uh, she goes into explaining the different types of modes. And also gets in a little bit of detail about where, why this is important and where it's captured on the MDS um, and then it goes into the resident assessment instrument definitions. Um, so instead of trying to find this on the RAI manual, which is uh, like 1,300 pages long, this gives you the uh, quotes right off the bat. And so let's talk about concurrent. And this is the resident assessment instrument or RAI definition. The treatment of two residents at the same time, these residents are not performing the same or similar activities. And the reason that's important is if they are performing same or similar, that would fall under group. So um, these are patients doing dissimilar, different activities. Um, both of these residents are in line of sight of the treating therapist or assistant. So we've got to be able to make sure that we're seeing these patients actually doing the activity to still bill for the service. Now, that doesn't mean that you just watch them and therefore it's skilled. But anyway, line of sight. Um, the two residents do not need to have the same insurance. But if you put a part A with a part B, um, what would happen is the A you could fall under the concurrent regulations, but the B could not. They don't have concurrent billing in part B. So um, anyway, all, for all practicality, you're going to be putting A's and in insurances that bill like part A together. Um, so with that said, What's the benefit of doing concurrent? Well, it's purely productivity. It has nothing to do with the benefit of the patient. For a group, you're putting people together for the purpose of, of allowing them to work in, a, in an environment where there's other people to encourage them in a social context to do better at that activity. That is the purpose of group. Um, with concurrent, it's more of a matter of convenience. You put patients together because, frankly, you're swamped and uh, you're dividing your attention between them. So with concurrent, while you do document that patient was treated in a concurrent scenario, um, so that alerts the reviewer that they're going to be um, looking at a reduction in minutes counted, um, so we have to document that, they don't care that the patient did something different. There's no benefit to the patient necessarily to doing the concurrent. So we don't have to worry about that. It's very dissimilar to group in that situation, in that scenario. What we should be mindful of, though, is the kind of patients we put in a concurrent situation. And I want to take you back to the um, low, moderate, high complexity evaluation codes for a minute. And I want to talk to you about the clinical presentation of your patients. You've got stable, evolving, and unstable. Think about this. If you're dividing your attention, you're obviously not going to be as in tune to what's going on with your patient. And if that's the case, you need that patient to be fairly cl clinically stable. Because if they're unstable, like let's say their blood pressures are out of whack or um, they've got variations in their movement patterns, 
that you have to be like right on top of them while you're working with them, that would not be a good patient to do concurrent with another patient. So what's the benefit to the patient? The benefit would be for patients that are higher level that it's okay for you to divide your attention. I'm thinking, you know, patients that are probably not going to need therapy for very long, so short-term rehab patients, um, patients that are mentally, cognitively stable, um, they're high-level, psychologically stable, um, and of course probably don't need much in the way of assistance to do an activity safely. Because technically during concurrent, you're still having them do stuff even though you're not hands-on with them. Um, otherwise, if you just divide your time between people and go back and forth, well, that's individual time. <laughs> You're just doing like five minutes here, three minutes there, two minutes there. So th- technically, that you could calculate that and build it as individual time. Um, but if you are truly having two people working at the same time doing different activities, um, that could be concurrent But again, I would want a higher level patient to safely and effectively do it. Anyway, I took too long to say that. Thanks, Michelle, for the question. I hope you guys have a pleasant day. Take care and God bless.